It's explosive, corrosive, toxic, infectious, radioactive, and just plain nasty. No one wants this stuff in their backyard, but to get to anywhere else, it's got to go down your street. Climb inside the cabs of the hazmat haulers and into the hot zone of a spill. Take a seat on the real Con Air. From remote control big rigs to containers that can really take a beating. Now, dangerous cargo on Modern Marvels. Industrial poisons, radioactive byproducts. Such things are generally brewed up far from where we live and work. But on their way to market or a waste dump, they go right by where we live and work in staggering quantities. Is hazmat pervasive? The US Department of Transportation estimates that there are 800,000 hazmat shipments daily. So it's out there. It's ubiquitous. That's the only way to characterize it. It's, it's everywhere. Given the numbers, occasional accidents are inevitable. But of increasing concern are not accidents, but the intentional use of hazmat as a weapon, including the unthinkable weapon, high-level nuclear waste. They're going to be dragging dirty bombs, basically, through every major metropolitan area in the United States. So if you learned the gritty details of hazmat hauling, would you be reassured or even more alarmed? Well, if there's one sure thing in this business, it's that knowledge is safety. We say, if you don't know, don't go. That's a fire service expression, but it also has to do with hazmat. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. The signs are out there, if you know what to look for. These diamond-shaped warning signs, or placards, tell the tale. There are nine categories of hazardous materials, each with an unmistakable symbol. Like a bomb for explosives, flames for combustibles, skull and crossbones for poisons, the radiating symbol for nuclear material, and tipped over lab beakers for corrosives. Here's a trailer that's loaded with a little bit of everything, from low-level radioactive waste to poisonous and infectious material and large quantities of flammables. As the trailer doors open, hold your breath. There's a noxious whiff of pent-up vapors from such things as medical waste. When the freight was loaded, it was segregated by hazard class according to strict regulations. An example would be you would not want a corrosive liquid loaded next to a poison material. Should they commingle or get together, you end up with a poison gas. A last cargo check. This load's ready for the road, so let's go for a ride. Please climb aboard. We're ready to start our hazmat trip. Hope you're not nervous. From a Southern California terminal, the rigs bound for the East Coast, merging with all the other toxic traffic. You can't get on the highway without coming in close proximity of some type of hazardous load. This hall's in expert hands. Charles Potter has logged more than two million miles on big rigs. He's one of a growing number of college-educated truckers, and keeping up with the ever-changing rules and regulations keeps him in school. They instruct us on, on the paperwork, on placarding, labeling, markers. Every two years, we go through and get recertified. And how potentially dangerous is that witch's brew of chemicals in the back? Uh, a load like this, you can very easily spark off a fire, and with all the flammable liquid that's on this trailer, it'd be a large fire. With so much at stake, little is left to chance. This rig is equipped with Qualcomm's Omnitrax tracking system, a satellite link to both the central command center and the dispatcher's office. 
This is the antenna communication unit that goes on the top of the truck. This is the antenna itself that's inside the device, and this antenna is constantly tracking the satellite that allows for two-way messaging and position location reporting on the truck. This device here goes inside the cab, and this allows the driver to both send and receive messages using the keyboard or pre-formatted messages. The unit continuously updates the truck's position with global positioning information. And it does more than just deliver a GPS location. They can tell what engine speeds the, the engine's running out, how fast you're running, whether you've over-revved the engine, how long you are running down the road, numerous things. The system actually is connected to the vehicle uh, data bus. Now, that's very complicated for saying that trucks are technical now. All trucks have that same computer system. Our system actually ties into that, so we can actually notify dispatch of oil pressure problems, problems that are going on in the vehicle that you may not even know about through the idiot lights on the dashboard. But how do truckers feel about Big Brother knowing how fast they're going? At first I had a little trouble with it. I wasn't sure that I, I, I liked it. I almost felt like I was handcuffed. Believe me, if you, once you break down out in the middle of the nowhere and this Qualcomm is your only source of communication, you learn to appreciate it. For the real emergencies, there's a red button on the dash. This is our, button, our panic button. It's also tied into the Qualcomm. Should any type of an emergency arise, we can press that button and alert will go out to both our company and all law enforcement agencies in the area. Satellite tracking's original purpose was to control mobile inventory. As the nation switched from traditional warehousing to precise on-time delivery. But with the rise of terrorism, it's taken on a new role. Since September 11th, there's been an increased concern with security. So now we're tracking trucks to make sure that we know whether they're containing hazardous materials, where the hazmat is relative to populated places, water supplies, schools. And uh, that's the importance of tracking hazardous materials now. If a hazmat shipment breaches an unauthorized area, operators can disable the truck by shutting down the fuel supply from a computer terminal thousands of miles away. There's also an option to remotely lock trailer doors. Out of four million long haul trucks in North America, about 300,000 carry the Qualcomm system. Which ones? Look for the white domes on the top of the cab. Actually, my kids do that when we're on vacation is when we're driving as we look for the white domes. You know, and, and as you're driving around America, you will see those white domes on many different types of vehicles. But even the all-knowing satellites are no substitute for watchful truckers, who are more than the eyes and ears of the road. If you have a truck that's someplace, or a truck or a cargo that's not where it's supposed to be, when it's not supposed to be there, chances are another driver is going to see it. Particularly if you're hauling munitions or something like that, you're looking for people that are spending a little too much time watching you or coming up and asking you questions uh, which in the first place we're not allowed to talk about. And there's plenty drivers can't talk about. Tri-State Motor Transit routinely hauls munitions and other sensitive materials for the government. Some of their trucks operate in the highly secret ghost fleet, which is just that, a ghost fleet. It, it, it's a group of people we have that move things that are highly hush-hush. These classified movements answer only to their government clients. Not even trucking officials can track them. We call it the ghost fleet because we do know it's there, but what it does, we don't know. There's little mystery to this hazmat load as we finally hop off. It's been loaded correctly, placarded prominently, driven professionally. The job is as dangerous as you allow it to be. 
as long as you've done everything you can, you're gonna have a safe trip. Unfortunately, this wasn't always the case. There was a time when things like nitroglycerin and dynamite were handled and hauled like so many sacks of concrete with predictable results. The cost of satellite tracking equipment is about $2,000 per truck, plus $50 a month. Dangerous Cargo will return on Modern Marvels. Hazmat's heavy lifting is done by rail. A railroad tank car can hold more than 30,000 gallons, or three times as much as a tanker truck making for a toxic ocean on steel wheels. Because there's 225,000 or more tank cars operating in the United States. At any given time, maybe a third to a half of them are out there moving somewhere, delivering product. So it's a very, very big part of our uh, hazmat economy. How are all these big tin cans put together? With acres of steel and blizzards of welding sparks. Steel up to 1 and 3 eighths inches thick and 12 feet wide is rolled into a ring. Long steel fingers called mandrel arms expand within the cylinder to make it perfectly round. A 12,000 ton cold forming press, the world's largest, punches out the hubcap shaped tank heads. Heads are positioned by the 30,000 pound pull of a vacuum pad and the whole assembly or tub is fused together by laser-guided welders. The tub is wrapped in insulation, then jacketed in a second layer of steel. The axle assembly is called a truck. One final piece of business, stenciling, and it's ready to roll. Today's massively strong tank cars are a far cry from the way we used to ship dangerous cargo. There's a famous statement by the chemist of the Pennsylvania Railroad. We give more attention to shipping a carload of horses than we do to a carload of dynamite, which I think tells you probably all you want to know. America was blown, blasted, and dynamited into shape in the 19th century. Black powder won the wars and carved out the right of way for the Transcontinental Railroad. Nitroglycerin and other high explosives uncorked the oil wells in rich veins of coal and iron that made America an industrial superpower. So how do we haul this hair trigger stuff to the blast zones? Sometimes, believe it or not, in briefcases aboard passenger trains. Makers of explosives would send out salesmen and they would carry samples with them. And the railroads would discover that uh, someone was in, in the passenger car with a suitcase with black powder in it or with uh, a high explosive. And, uh, and they didn't like that. But nothing was done about it until downtown San Francisco was blown sky high. On April 16, 1866, Samuel Knight, superintendent of the Wells Fargo shipping office, ducked into a back room where a crate was leaking some sort of oil. The box was marked only as express freight, so Knight directed a workman to open it up with a hammer and chisel. The oily stuff was nitroglycerin, which can explode with the slightest shock. 14 people died, including Superintendent Knight. Even in far off Washington, D.C., there were repercussions. Congress soon passed a bill banning explosives from passenger trains and vessels. Placarding came next. In 1883, the Pennsylvania Railroad directed that cars carrying explosives were to display the diamond-shaped signs. There was just one problem. Anyone who lives in the country will know that a stop sign is actually a target. And what the Pennsylvania Railroad realized was that when they would placard their freight cars with signs that said explosives, all the boys who were out target practicing when the train went by would take a shot at the sign on the car. But stray bullets were the least of the railroad's worries. Deadly and costly accidents were common. 
among the worst, a munitions train that blew up in Crestline, Ohio in 1903. And in 1905, a runaway dynamite car plowed into a passenger train in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All this carnage had to end. So in 1907, the railroads created a regulatory body called the Bureau of Explosives. Unlike some special interest groups, it worked. There's a big reduction after 1907. So by the time you get to the 1920s, the dangers of shipping explosives have really receded. In about 15 years, they've really solved this problem. But one problem was succeeded by another. The rise of the chemical and petrochemical industries in the early 20th century put tons of explosive liquids on the move. Chief among them, gasoline. The explosive properties of gas, though ideal for your car engine, make it dangerous to haul. On a hot summer day in 1915, in a quiet Oklahoma train yard, a worker found out how dangerous. He took the lid off the tank car. Well, that's like, uh, that's like opening a beer bottle that you've shaken up. And it went all over the yard. And the oil lights set off a tank car full of this. And if you look at a picture of Ardmore, Oklahoma, right after the blast, it, uh, it's devastated. What caused the explosion, like this refinery fire, was gasoline's tendency to expand and build up pressure. Tank cars were crowned with distinctive domes that provided expansion room for gas. Later on, shippers found it was more economical to only partially fill tank cars. The domes were gradually phased out, giving way to the streamlined cylindrical forms of today. By the 1960s, tank cars were safe, but not the tracks below. The reason for this is that in the 1960s, the railroads are deteriorating. And their roadbed is deteriorating, and their equipment is deteriorating. So what you begin to see in the 1960s is this system doesn't work anymore. And it doesn't work because the, the railroads can't afford to maintain their roadbed. This recipe for disaster had yet another ingredient. War. Munitions bound for Vietnam were rolling over the dilapidated railroads. There were a number of accidents, including this one in 1973. A boxcar caught fire from an unknown cause in the Roseville, California yards near Sacramento. What might have been a small localized fire quickly became a regional emergency because the car was full of bombs. 14 boxcars detonated in a spectacular chain reaction. Flaming shrapnel was thrown into nearby neighborhoods. At the time of Roseville, a revolution was underway. In 1970, both the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration were founded. To the EPA and OSHA, it was time for the government to stop playing second fiddle to the railroads and their Bureau of Explosives. When they say, oh, this is unconstitutional, letting the Bureau of Explosives do this kind of thing, so it becomes much more centralized in the Department of Transportation and the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, roughly about 1970. The story of hazmat hauling has mirrored the last century and half of American history. The rise and fall of the great railroads, the coming of big government, the advent of the environmental movement, an explosive history to be sure. Here are some fiery collisions that are no accidents. They're staged to test the world's strongest transportation container. It had better be, because it carries the most dangerous cargo of all, high-level nuclear waste. A collision occurs between a train and a car or truck every 90 minutes in the U.S. Dangerous Cargo will return on Modern Marvels. In the 50s, America was bullish on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And in September 1957, we finally put it to work. The city of Pittsburgh was lighted with the aid of atomic power at Shipping Port. 
this new source of power had been put to work. It was a history-making accomplishment. A milestone, yes, but something of a millstone for future generations. At the time, there were no plans for the disposal of spent nuclear fuel. Permanent storage of used uranium pellets with a half-life of thousands of years was beyond the technology of the day. The problem was simply deferred to a future time. That time has finally arrived. In 2002, Congress approved the location of a permanent storage facility for spent nuclear fuel. The site, Yucca Mountain, Nevada. The first of several thousand highly radioactive shipments are scheduled to begin in 2010, which has got a lot of people spooked. My colleagues call this mobile Chernobyl. That's truly what it is. This is an enormous amount of radiation being dragged through people's neighborhoods. How it will get through our neighborhoods safely is a matter of the most painstaking preparation. Radioactive materials are subject to the most scrutiny, not only in terms of what containers are used to transport those kinds of materials, but the spill contingency plans and the qualifications, training, and equipment of the response personnel. At 103 nuclear plants scattered across the nation, some 40,000 metric tons of radioactive waste have accumulated. It's in the form of spent nuclear fuel assemblies, which are bundles of 17-foot-long metal rods studded with pellets of enriched uranium. No longer potent enough to fire the boilers of a power plant, you still wouldn't want to stand next to one unprotected. You'd get a lethal dose of radiation. Just getting them out of where they are now is a formidable technical challenge. The radioactive waste, which is basically the spent fuel from nuclear power plants, is lying in enormous swimming pools next to every nuclear power plant in the country. It is the sheer mass of water, some 40 feet deep, that acts as a radioactive shield. It also cools down the rods, which still release nuclear energy. To move the waste, a massive crane lowers a container called a cask into the pool. Robotic arms load in the fuel assemblies. The cask lid is bolted down. So far, the operation has taken place underwater. Hoisted from the pool, the cask is backfilled with helium gas and placed on a custom trailer. Outer protective layers, or impact limiters, are fitted over the cask. The container's surface is decontaminated. It will then be ready for the journey to Yucca Mountain. Radiation tight, immensely strong. We do an awful lot of work to make sure that the transportation containers themselves will perform exceptionally well under all severe kinds of circumstances. How strong are the casks? At Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico, scientists have tried their best to break them. In one test, a cask-carrying tractor trailer was rammed at 80 miles an hour into a 700-ton concrete wall. In another, a rocket-powered locomotive was run at a cask on a tractor trailer, broadside. Casks have been drop tested from 30 feet, puncture tested, roasted in jet fuel for one hour. They've emerged blackened and dented, but structurally sound. And yet, critics say that the tests have fallen short of some extreme real world conditions. They're tested to 1400 degrees, a temperature which some accidents may exceed. Back in July of 2001, you had a fire in the Baltimore Tunnel. Had there been radioactive waste on that train, you could have caused thousands of cancer deaths. It would have cost tens of millions of dollars to clean up. The casks are not adequate, and they're not adequately tested either. The sheer weight of the cask, 15 tons or more, is another challenge as opposed to a normal shipment of a, a semi-trailer going down the road. He's got boxes stacked up from the front of the trailer to the back door. And in this instance, the weight of the shipping container is, tends to be concentrated towards the middle of the trailer or the rail car. All this dead weight in the middle of the trailer causes the rig to handle differently. 
trailer goes up and down like this and you feel it everywhere. Only the elite of long haul drivers will be entrusted with a load of nuclear waste. And they won't be alone. State police and the U.S. Army will escort each shipment door to door. They may also have other company. I would like to see Greenpeace blocking it at every reactor gate around the country. Uh, I don't want to block it on route because I believe this stuff is dangerous. I prefer to protect my people and use their gates to do it. Scrutinized by environmentalists, escorted by the military, tracked by satellites, the shipments will fan out over the interstate system. By the state of Nevada's estimate, Atlanta might see an average of one shipment per day, Chicago about one and a half. Closer to the Yucca Mountain Terminal, Salt Lake City could see about four. Closer yet, Las Vegas could see seven shipments per day. If all goes well, the casks will arrive at the repository, be offloaded onto an underground rail system, and deep within Yucca Mountain, be relieved of their radioactive freight. The multi-million dollar casks will be reused, sent back for another load. How safe is this plan? Just look at the record, says the nuclear industry. We have had almost 3,000 shipments of spent nuclear fuel in the United States uh, for almost 40 years now. There has never been a release of the radioactive material contents from the canisters. But it is the unprecedented scale of the Yucca Mountain project that's the biggest worry. Between 50,000 to 100,000 separate shipments, depending on whether they will go mostly by truck or by train. In all those shipments, some fear that there is too much room for error. You're going to have accidents. You're going to contaminate large areas of land. The DOE, which I believe underestimates the risk, has acknowledged that you can contaminate as much as 42 square miles. That's basically the size of the District of Columbia. But in the days since they first flipped the switch, most of us have come to rely on nuclear power. The fact is that 20% of what we got here comes from nuclear. I used to ask people in hearings how they got up to the ninth floor for the hearing room. The elevator, well, the next time you can come up the stairs. A smooth ride up the elevator, and hopefully an uneventful trip to the desert for all those tons of nuclear waste, beginning about 2010. Lethal, maybe, but radiation has no motive to escape, which is definitely not the case with the dangerous human cargo of the real Con Air. Nuclear power plants produce nearly 800 billion kilowatts per year, or enough electricity for 75 million homes. Dangerous Cargo will return on Modern Marvels. Here's an airline that prides itself on nondescript jets, Spartan refreshments, unfriendly service, and long check-in lines. It's the last airline you'd want to log frequent flyer miles on. Welcome aboard, Con Air. You have to be indicted to be invited. It's an airline where you don't have to make a reservation. Uh, we will make that reservation for you. Official name, JPATS, the Justice Prisoner and Alien Transportation System. JPATS is the federal agency charged with transporting our most dangerous cargo of the human variety. Anybody that you see on television, on your nightly news, or anybody that you read about in the newspaper, j -Pats will eventually move that individual. j -Pats is an outgrowth of the U.S. Marshal Service, the oldest federal law enforcement agency, founded by George Washington in 1789. Among other things, U.S. Marshals have the task of hunting fugitives, and transporting them to far-flung courts and jails. They chaperone their charges on the conveyance of the day. Stagecoach, train, van, or automobile. But by the 1980s, they were approaching a crisis of inefficiency. While prison populations were soaring, marshals were still escorting prisoners one or two at a time. 
not only that, but in those days, you used your own personal vehicle. Uh, there was no security cage inside that vehicle. Uh, the prisoners were in the back seat right behind you. Uh, so there were escapes. In the mid-80s, the Marshal Service received a surplus airliner from the FAA and began operating its prisoner-only flights. That 127 eliminated virtually all the car trips, all the van trips. That's basically how it got started with 1727. It came to be known as Con Air, years before the movie by the same name. Today, j Pants has grown to be a huge land and air transportation system, moving a quarter of a million passengers a year, with regular air service to more than 40 domestic and international destinations. Although it's not regular service in the usual sense. The schedules that we keep are only known to ourselves. We constantly change up the schedule. It's one of the ways that we can keep the risk to us and the threat potential as it, to its absolute lowest. So, ready to take a flight on Con Air? Departure point, Kansas City Downtown Airport. If all goes well, it's a 55-minute flight to the JPATS hub at Oklahoma City. Your journey begins on a heavily guarded U.S. Marshal or Bureau of Prisons bus or van, which pulls up right onto the runway apron. Right on time, your flight arrives. An old 727 with plain Jane graphics. We don't want to have a big Marshal star on the side of the airplane or something that would let everybody know what we were doing. The quieter, the better. Shotguns at the ready, guards form a security perimeter around the aircraft. Their job is to meet any incoming threat. Since many outside parties would like to get at the prisoners, either to free them or harm them. The United States Marshal Service is responsible for the Federal Protection Program. And those witnesses who are testifying against organized crime or whatever, they use our aircraft to move these type of movements. Within this perimeter, there is a second ring of security, where guards shackle prisoners, search them, and track their paperwork as they file from bus to airplane. Back at JPAT's headquarters, an intelligence update. Do you have a minute to give me that brief and security briefing on those aircraft? I do. We're moving some terrorists uh, throughout the Northeast, and um, uh, today uh, we've got uh, one person that we're moving for the Bureau of Prisons that was uh, an extreme escape risk. The terrorists, do we know if they're associated with the Al-Qaeda? What's, what's intelligence tell us about uh, that? The intelligence that, we, that, that we've developed is that they are, in fact, uh, associated, uh, have cl very close ties and associations with the Al-Qaeda okay. uh, terrorist group. All right, very good. Not only for terrorists, but for every passenger, j -Pats has gathered detailed intelligence. There may be close to 113 different type of elements that we have to review before we even move a prisoner. Uh, some of these prisoners are testifying against other prisoners. So we have to keep them separated from the people they're testifying against. Some of the prisoners are gang members, and they have rival gang members. Passenger manifests warn of conflicts. Gang members will be separated. Escape risks will be watched closely. One passenger, particularly hazardous, will kill law enforcement officers, or LEOs. Shackled at ankle, waist, and wrist, the prisoners file up the gangway and onto the airplane. The cabin is secured for takeoff. Minus the usual pleasantries, the federally required safety announcement. May I have your attention on the aircraft? At this time, all seatbelts required to be fastened and remain fastened throughout the flight. Do not Aviation enforcement officers perform the safety functions of flight attendants. Just don't expect service with a smile. I would have to say that the service and the food were pretty terrible. I, I would not uh, give two thumbs up on either. Uh, none of us are supposed to be or trained to be uh, waiters or waitresses. We consider the inside of our aircraft to be a maximum security institution. Uh, we take absolutely no chances on, on even allowing these prisoners to think that there's a chance to escape. Still on the real Con Air, there are no metal cages. Nor can prisoners be chained to the airplane due to federal safety rules. But some passengers are black boxed, fitted with additional restraints over their cuffs. 
Those black boxes are what we consider more high risk. We put them next to the windows, creating that situation where it's harder for them to get out of that aisle so that they can't get to our center aisle. One other thing, should you be tempted to make a sudden exit, there are no parachutes. We go down, you go down. You got your seatbelt on? For all the human dynamite on board, most problems are garden variety traveler's gripes. For example, many of these hardened criminals are afraid to fly. Like we have one on board right now who's extremely claustrophobic. They let us know about it ahead of time. We were able to make arrangements for that so that we could possibly keep him calm and or at least be able to identify who he is immediately and that way we can handle him. Jittery cons and all, this stretch in an airborne maximum security prison passes without incident. Well, we're about to touch down right now. From the airplane, the prisoners go down a jetway that leads to the Oklahoma City Federal Transfer Center, located right off the runway. Going directly from jet back to prison without passing go. Basically, the inmates walk off of our institution in the air. They walk right into the jetway into that institution and their feet never hit the ground. The most dangerous or are notorious of prisoners, the Timothy McVeighs and Unabombers of the system, are not transported on the 727. These cons get a sort of reverse VIP treatment, a flight in a small jet, such as this Hawker aircraft. They are usually black boxed, and the most extreme risks are fitted with a Hannibal Lecter-like mask. This is one instance where you don't want the ride on the corporate jet. Since 1995, J-PATS has moved a million and a half criminals humanely without a single escape. Apart from the movies, the real con air is little known. Perhaps because their schedules aren't posted, the airplanes aren't marked, and they seldom lose any luggage, let alone a passenger. Coronair's perfect record isn't matched by the other movers of dangerous cargo, which is why those rubber hazmat suits are quickly coming into fashion. In the critical hours after the September 11th terrorist attacks, JPATS was one of the very few air services allowed to fly, aside from military aircraft. Dangerous Cargo will return on Modern Marvels. Train wrecks, rollovers, spills, they happen. Despite training and preparations, spills do happen. And when they do happen, it's important uh, to respond quickly and decisively and to have the proper resources ready to go. When the trucker's panic button is hit or 911 dialed, the so-called first responders converge. Local police or firefighters. At that point, we decide um, whether we're going to be very aggressive and offensive in trying to handle the emergency or defensive and stay back and possibly just as simple as wait for a cleanup crew to come in and take care of it. What determines that response is the answer to an all-important question. The very first thing the responder wants to know is, what is this stuff? One source of right now information is a chemical industry hotline. Step into its inner sanctum. You're in the uh, Chemtrek Emergency Center, and this is a 24-hour emergency center that provides, uh, receives calls involving chemical spills, hazardous materials, uh, accidents. Chemtrek Mike speaking, how can I help you? Uh, what's the tank car number? Chemtrek is wired into the nationwide chemical shipping network. Operators can match a tank car number to a bill of lading, instantly identifying its cargo. We get them information quickly, uh, nobody gets hurt, and uh, everybody goes home. Back at the scene of a spill, a hot zone is identified, into which no one may enter without protective gear. A transition area called a warm zone is staked out for equipment staging and decontamination. One of the most frightening emergency scenarios is a large-scale chlorine gas leak. The familiar household chemical chlorine can be deadly when undiluted. Chlorine gas that was used in World War I as a poison uh, gas chemical 
uh, is routinely shipped on 90-ton rail cars. Any accident involving that one rail car uh, could devastate a community 20 miles away. Fortunately, this is only a drill. Inhalation dangers such as chlorine gas get the full-blown hazmat treatment. With level A protective suits and their SCBA, or scuba-type breathing apparatus. First we put on our SCBA, then we don our suit. The suit is made of a polyunistane rubber. We have on three layer of gloves. We have boots to go over the booty that's on the suit. Once we're ready to go in, we'll don our masks, zip up the suit, and proceed into the incident. Inside the hot zone, the real danger spots are sniffed out with high-tech sensors. We have organic vapor uh, analyzers. We have combustible gas indicators, toxic vapor analyzers, and things like that. Basically, anything, hopefully, that we can encounter, we have some way to detect it. The first responder's role is containment, securing the area and, if possible, stopping the leak. In this case, hazmat techs position a specially designed chlorine cap over the leaking valve. The fire department's job is now mostly done, yet the contaminated area must be cleaned up, and that's when yet another hotline may buzz, at the spill center. Because if you're a trucking company driving from east coast to west coast, the spill could happen anywhere. Chances are you're not going to know who's available, who is qualified, who has the right equipment and materials right now to respond to that release. There are about 3,000 companies throughout the U.S. that specialize in hazmat cleanup. What do they use to sop up a solid, toxic mess? Certain forms of naturally absorbent clay, which you know as kitty litter. Sorbent materials, kitty litter is common uh, in the industrial setting, or um, smart kitty litter, kitty litter that has uh, an affinity for a particular chemical or a particular type of material. And finally, someone has to foot a rather sizable bill. The average amount released is 104 gallons, and the average cost to clean that up nationwide right now is about $9,800. When it comes to bulk releases, releases from tank cars, the costs are significantly higher, oftentimes $200,000 and up. A unique American law fixes responsibility for cleanup costs. It's not who or what caused the accident. If you were carrying the stuff, you clean it up. So it doesn't matter that you didn't mean to have the spill. If you had care, custody, and control of the, of the material, if it's your chemical and it spills, as a matter of law, you are responsible. So that's very different from, say, medical malpractice, where there's negligence. There are some 60,000 reported spills each year in the U.S. So if you're looking for job security in a growing industry, consider trading in that business suit for a level A hazmat suit. 800,000 daily shipments, 60,000 yearly spills. What does it all add up to? A very, very large percentage of hazardous material shipments go from point A to point B, unnoticed, undetected, without any trouble of any kind. In fact, the majority of those 800,000 shipments a day are transported safely, without incident. I was quoted in the Washington Post a few years ago in an article called Bombs on the Beltway, where I pointed out that particular year, almost four times more people were killed in skateboard accidents than in all hazmat transportation in the United States. And that got a lot of hoots, but a lot of people checking. He says, he's right. Over 150 years, we've progressed from buckboard wagons to super containers that can withstand the impact from a locomotive. A bumpy ride at times, as it will be again, because this is one long haul that never ends.